All right. Uh, hey, everyone. I'm Alicia Sullivan. I'm a product manager on Earth Engine, um, and I'm really excited to have a panel here today to talk about um, understanding the EU deforestation regulation and the role of geospatial data. Can you all hear me OK? OK, great. Awesome. Um, so we have an amazing panel here that are going to talk here very shortly um, that are experts across the, the space, both from industry, uh, nonprofits, um, et cetera. So to start with, I want to just really very briefly touch on the EUDR. I know Remy's going to be talking about this. But um, in starting in 2024, companies uh, that sell goods into the European Union are, are required to prove that these goods were not grown on land deforested after December of 2020, which is a very large uh, commitment and things and will be difficult for some companies to meet. So we're trying to work together to understand how we can help uh, companies meet this compliance and uh, these organizations that will be represented today will be speaking to that. As part of the um, EUDR, there are seven key commodities that are, um, and their derivatives that are part of the legislation. Uh, you can see them up here. Um, and the main industries that are impacted are, of course, consumer packaged goods, uh, retail, furniture, automotive, et cetera. So real quickly, today's session, we're going to have three parts. We're going to hear from our experts. Um, they'll have five minutes each to speak about their uh, perspective. Um, we're going to have a quick panel discussion and then uh, open up questions to the audience. So with that, uh, let's get started. Remy, would you like to come on up? Thank you. Thank you, Lisha. Hi, everybody. Um, so um, <coughs> I'm, I'm going to give a really brief introduction to the to the EU regulation of deforestation and uh, the role that FAO is playing in it somehow. Um, I think my question was, what's known about the process to be compliant today and what's the role of uh, Earth observation and data? Um, <clears throat> so I tried to put, so first of all, the, the text of the regulation itself is fully public, fully available, and I encourage you to read it because it's actually, it's long but it's extremely detailed and extremely uh, um, uh, informationful. And there's also associated to it a regular frequently asked questions section that is published by the by European Commission that is making it uh, easier to read. And it's only 20 pages, so it's, uh, it really makes it uh, simpler. So um, probably every, if I have any answers to the questions that are asked today, I picked them up already in the fact, so I encourage you to read it. Um, <clears throat> So I, I wanted to put some main compliance points. Uh, the first is um, the responsibility of the of on the regulation and compliance is fully on the operators. It's not the countries. It's not on the on the governments. It's on the operators that are uh, proposing products uh, into the into the market. Um, one uh, okay key key things the deforestation is uh, is uh, for the regulation means conversions to agricultural land use and degradation means conversions of um, primary or naturally regenerated forest into plantations and that's that and um, so you've seen all the agricultural communities they should not be deforestation um, with any deforestation and timber should not be with degradation um, there is uh, something around the geolocation. So the, what is compliant is that uh, all the operators must uh, submit the geolocation information from each farm that, uh, from where any of the products that enter the market come from. That's relatively straightforward. Um, one thing that is also very important is that it should be deforestation free and legal uh, as per the legislation of the country where it comes from. And, and this has not been uh, tackled a lot yet. And the cutoff date, we talked about that. Um, what's important to remember is that there is um, there's no commodity ban, there's no country ban, whatever the benchmarking system will be. Um, there is a, there is a benchmarking system which uh, which will be interesting to follow in the in the coming in the coming month because it's not published yet, so we don't know yet what's the list of countries that are considered standard, low, or high risk. But those countries that will be considered standard, low, or high risk will have from the, the importers from the European countries that, gets the, that get the compliance information to them, um, the products that come from standard countries will, will be monitored 3% of the, of the compliance information. And uh, low risk is, will be lower than to 1%, and high risk will be higher than to 9%. So it doesn't mean anything on the operators. It means something on the amount of data that will be checked by the importing countries. 
And it's important, and, and the European Commission has been trying to push the message on this. Um, I, I don't know how, how long five minutes is, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have, like, another two minutes? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I just wanted to really briefly uh, talk about the... So I'm, I'm, I'm working in FAO in the forestry division. I'm technical lead on the forest of the partnership, which is... Um, which is uh, funded by USAID and US State departments with WRI leading, FAO co-leading, and we have the immense uh, chance to be uh, partnering with uh, NASA server inside, with Google, and in, in, in particular with the Earth Engine team, and with Unilever as a, as a first partner. Um, <clears throat> and uh, within the Forest Data Partnership, we've been in contact with, the, with um, a dialogue platform called Diaska uh, that is led by uh, the German corporation and now the European Commission, uh, talking about forest monitoring and traceability and legality schemes and solutions. And we have just received a green light to go ahead with a proposal for a pub data digital public infrastructure prototype that will be done in collaboration with Axtac, who have developed a asset registry. I can talk about what the asset registry means, but it's basically a, it's an index system based on the S2 uh, index system from Google, and that provides uh, basically unique GeoIDs. And they've asked us to, to basically construct that line of, uh, of, uh, of infrastructure to provide information, minimal information that can be public and that can be completely open for anybody. And that will probably mean either third party verification or importing countries to have tools at hand to verify the information that's coming in the, the line. I'll, I'll be happy to develop furthermore, but I just wanted to tell you that this is, this is something that's ongoing and more important than the, the money associated to it. What's important is that we've got the mandate from the EC to develop this, which is sometimes extremely tricky to have. So we're really happy to move this forward. And uh, yeah, we, we're going to have a collaboration with Ground here from Google and with the team of, uh, of Gino. Uh, the Axtac solution, of course, is going to be powered by Earth Engine somehow. And this is going to come with the mandate of, of Diaska. So I'll finish here. And I'm really happy to go forward with the questions. All right. It's also. Four things. Uh, th these are the four things that we think that will be will be key uh, for us to um, kind of contribute to this to this discussion using the tools that uh, we are preparing. So, first one is defining what's the scope of application um, because it refers to forests uh, basically at this point, and uh, so you have to check it out where this will be really applied. The second is. Um, this whole thing about classifying the risk of the country or region. So we have a kind of a, an idea of how this could be done, um, not just classifying the whole country, but thinking on something different. Um, then, um, obviously, the land use change assessment post to uh, 2020, and, uh, and some, one or two ideas for the traceability, which is not exactly what we are working right now, but it uh, can be used. Good. So for the... Uh, application, um, we did a, a, a quick uh, view on this, which is um, the, the, you need to know where is the, the, the forest, right? According to the definition, in this case, the definition of FAO, I think later on we will have like known wood, known wood, no, other woodlands, right? And then we're still uh, missing the uh, no wood um, uh, environments, right? And so why this is important? Because if you see that this map, like uh, on, in, in the middle, you have uh, everything that, is, that was forest in 2020. Uh, uh, in Brazil, we, we have a classification that is, would be equivalent to the FAO classification of forest. And uh, the other one is everything else that is uh, not considered forest, but is nature, native vegetation also. A lot of the cerrados, for example, will be out of this uh, definition. So 30% uh, of the deforestation happens on that area. but. 50% of the conversion for cropland, for example, it's happening there. So if basically, by this definition, 50% of the deforestation, or as I say, like loss of natural habitats for, uh, for um, you know, crops will be simply out. And most of the soya bean, for example, would be out because they are basically being converted in this area. So that's why it's very important to, to have this uh, uh, 
good definition of the scope. Uh, second is um, the classification of risk. So there's uh, two things that can be done. One is using the historical um, land cover land use maps, and we have on Mapiomas, to track um, what happens on the last 10, 15 years or so, so you, you understand how much deforestation you have embedded on, on those areas. So for example, in this case here, it's the um, um, you know, cropland in general, like in the Cerrados. So what you see there is that 35% of the increase in cropland between 2010 and 2020 in the Cerrados was actually on areas that were um, natural habitats uh, before. And forest is like the, the two uh, parts in the, up, up there. So uh, this is a way to kind of uh, have an idea of how much deforestation you have on, on, on those areas. The other thing is that we have this annual deforestation reports, which access the potential illegality of every single deforestation in Brazil in the last four years. So you can have an idea of you know, how much uh, commitments with rules you have on those areas. So for example, if you have an area where people are really following the law, if you say that you can't do something, it will not be done, right? That's the more or less the idea. But if, you, if you're in a region that everybody's playing in, with illegality, you, you don't expect that they will just follow the rules because somebody said that they have to do it, right? So that's, that's a, a good way to assess risk. And so I think that the way we should translate this is that you take a country like Brazil, it's very big. It's not something that you say, look, Brazil is all in one place or in another place. Actually, this varies a lot by crop and by, by region. So uh, the way we see this is that this should evolve to something like you know, pr crops, uh, products, no, or, or commodities, versus regions, for example. So if you take the Amazon, palm oil, uh, cocoa, coffee, and, and rubber, it's definitely very low uh, risk, um, definitely low risk. But wood, soy, and cattle will be very high, high risk. And if you go to the Cerrados, wood is not high risk. It will be like standard. And then uh, and, and so on. So the idea here is that you that we should think about that more like uh, a little bit more, you know, um, um, so it's like a, yeah, with, with a little more uh, detail than just say one country is one place and the other uh, other place. This is very important for the incentive for the people to do the right thing, because if you put pull everybody together in one one spot, you make everyone complain. And if you say that these are different, you have those guys that are kind of on the blue. They will be cheering for the whole rule on the other side. So that's very important for the implementation. Yeah, this is for uh, the land cover. So uh, using the, the maps, the, the land cover, land use maps that we have, uh, you can identify the um, all, all chains uh, from, for any direction and for the different types of crops or commodities. Uh, over the time uh, for each property, uh, if you want, right? So the deforestation specifically, I'm not talking about the relation, but deforestation specifically, since we have report on every single deforestation, a report like this for every single deforestation that happens in Brazil since uh, January 2019, um, you can locate every deforestation on, on the properties. So basically, if you have a property, you, you would know if there is a deforestation there. And there is this question whether the application of the law is related to the area that you actually claim that you plant or the property. I must say the only way to make this happen is if you consider the property. That's the only way you can, you can uh, manage this uh, properly. So if you have a deforestation in the property after uh, 2020, sorry, you don't qualify for, for the export because it's too difficult to uh, go beyond that in terms of control. Yeah, and so this is the, the report how it does. And lastly, for the uh, traceability, uh, there is many things on the traceability, where, but here we're focusing on, on things that will help you in large scale to understand if the things make sense or not in terms of like where the the um, you know the the products come from. So the first thing is to estimate the potential production of that commodity in a specific um, property. So you check, you see the map, how much is the crop land that you have there, and then you can estimate, oh, it's between this and that that you could have. So nobody can claim that they are selling like, I don't know, five times what you, you could on that property because that's the illegal property comparing to others, for example, right? And the other one is the viability of the product to get to a specific processing plant. 
So it's basically say you are here, and then the guy is saying that he's buying this property from 500 kilometers away, uh, this product, forget it. That's totally unviable to bring this product to the other plug. So, so you can kind of, uh, um, find, and this is not just a radio, right? This is like really the, the path. So it's kind of a finding paths that, that would give you mileage. And this is like vary from infrastructure, distance, weather, and so on. So these are four ways in which we can contribute with GE, maps, and et cetera, for this thing. And let's make it happen because it makes a difference in terms of deforestation. All right, now Pierre. Is it working? Yeah, perfect. I would like to like keep Tasso's energy, but uh, with this microphone, I will still be in contact with the sound. Uh, Pierre Crambeau, so I'm working for LDC. I know that the crowd is mostly scientists in this conference, so before I start, who knows Louis Dreyfus company in the room? Okay, thank you very much for all the people that doesn't know it. It makes my two first slides useful. So LDC is a French uh, merchant on agricultural goods that started uh, uh, working in 1851, so long before I was born. Uh, we employ around 17,000 employees on 10 platforms. I will explain what platforms are afterward. We shipped uh, 80 million tons of commodity on average annually for a total net sale of 59.9 billion US dollars. That's a lot of money. Uh, in uh, more than 100 countries over six uh, geographic regions. So if there's one thing you need to remember, we are in the agricultural game for a long time. We sell lots of things everywhere. So platforms. So we have different platforms to actually structure the, the company. So some of them are actually commodities, coffee, cotton, food and feed solution, grains and all seed, juice, rice and sugar. And if you listen carefully to the other speakers, you realize that coffee, and grain and all, and all seeds are actually like, focusing on, on EUDR, directly challenged by the regulation. We have transversal um, platforms, carbon solutions and global markets, and freight, which is dealing with all the vessels uh, that are shipping the commodities all over the world. This is more or less the workflow that we need to actually be compliant with EUDR. So if anyone, after my presentation, have a solution that is at scale at countries for any countries and any commodities, please come with us. We want you in our team. <laughs> so first step, the first step is actually mapping your supply chain. That's the, the first real issue. Because mapping your supply chain means that you're actually aggregating national and partner databases. Everything is inconsistent. Everything is uh, set differently, so you need to like align all the metadata, make sure that it's actually describing what you want to see, and then you need to also understand things that are actually not dealt by your debt by your company. So sometimes we bought things from someone else, and we need to understand his supply chain. Once you get your supply chain, you need to get the plots because you know where the commodity is actually coming from, but you need to define the geometry. So as Remy was explaining, less than four hectares, you need one point more than four hectares, you need a polygon. So then a new nightmare starts. You're gathering again multiple inconsistent sources. What do we have? We have public database, cars in Brazil. We have geosurveys. So we send people on the field to actually make the delineation of our geometries. And we have private providers that are just doing the same jobs for us. Once you get these geometries, you need to check them. Because you, you don't know, are they, are they the truth? Are they at the right place? Are they under water bodies, you don't know uh, at start. So first, you need to make this uh, geometry assessments, making sure that they are actually describing the, the plot. And then you also need to check uh, if the geometry in itself is making sense. So anyone that has actually dealt with a geometry knows that a geometry can be broken. Like you, you, you track with a GPS the, the coordinates of your field. And for some reasons, the GPS just go backward from one point to another, and boom, your geometry is broken, and you cannot perform uh, any analysis anymore. So all these checks need to be performed. You have your geometries, and now you start doing real Earth observation. So you need to identify what the satellite imagery, uh, what type of satellite imagery are actually uh, useful for this analysis. So step one is to leverage public data sets so that we can perform risk assessment. 
to know which countries or which administrative areas are actually high risk. And this is where we will do the due diligence. And for that, it's still unclear uh, what level of precision we need to reach. So we don't know if public data sets are sufficient. We don't know if we need to use some very high resolution data even for the risk assessment. So that's an open question and the FAQ of, uh, of the regulation will reopen soon and that's the type of question that we will uh, ask again. Um, we also have questions about the revisiting period because if you have some commodities that are changing from one year to another, you also need to remap your polygon, so you need to redo the analysis uh, all over again. Identify satellite imagery. You have your imagery, you have your plot, and now you're starting to do uh, actual image analysis. So you have a field that has been uh, analyzed in your risk assessment uh, workflow, and it's flag red. There is deforestation according to the forest data set that you're using uh, for the cutting date. We don't want to discard all the fields uh, that are uh, set to red on a 10 meter resolution data set. Because if we do so, we will lose countless small holders that will be flagged as deforested. So there we need to use very high resolution dat data to perform real change detection algorithm to really understand if something happened on this field. And the problem with this very step is that the, um, the data that we are using are actually flagging more or less half of the fields uh, that we are actually analyzing. So it means that half of the field of the world needs to be mapped with very high resolution data and we need to perform this, algo this uh, change detection algorithm on half of the field of the world. So our problem now is really a commercial problem because the pricing of doing such an analysis is simply prohibitive, even for us, LDC, that is one of the big players in the agricultural uh, market. So that's one huge issue that is not uh, yet uh, completely answered. And if you've done everything, you know what field is actually uh, deforested, what field is not deforested, you still have one step to actually uh, manage, which is taking actions. Because, okay, we know that this field is deforested, but what is going to happen to this farmer? So we have different options. The first one, of course, is just discard this, uh, this farmer from the EU market which leads to a segregation issue. Like when the goods are actually coming to the mills or to the crushing plant, you need to segregate it from the rest. So having like a pile of bag of coffee that are EU compliant and another one that is EU non-compliant. And that's uh, one of the key issues that we are facing within our uh, supply chain. And we are still uh, asking to the European Commission if there will be any mitigation solution so that farmers that have been um, uh, removed from the European market could re-enter this market by performing some extra, extra work, replanting, regrowing uh, on, uh, on their deforested field. So again, anyone that has this, please come to me. I would be super happy to, to discuss. Yeah, thank you. So I'm not going to pretend we have that, but that is the direction I think we are going as NGAS. So hopefully I'll kind of take everything you've seen just now and provide it in the context of a story on how we're trying to work with our customers and partners. So NGIS is an organization that's been partnered with Google for over 10 years. Uh, NGIS is, a, is an Australian geospatial consultancy. A lot of the work that we do really in partnership with Google is focusing on making sure that Earth Engine and other geospatial tools are reaching customers and especially our joint customers. So there's really kind of three areas in which we're partnered with Google. I'll go through these fairly briefly because we've got a lot to cover on the EUDR side. So we really think about solutions, co-development, and go-to-market. How do we take Earth Engine and some of these core technologies and bring them into the kinds of systems and workflows that organizations can use? We're also a cloud build, sell, and service partner. Not necessarily relevant to all of you in the room, but the idea is that we know what we're doing with Google Cloud, and we like to use as much of Google Cloud as possible in our solutions. And finally, we really think about ourselves as being aligned to Google's one gigaton goal. So we invest in some of the programs like the Google Earth Engine Publisher program, which you may have seen me present on earlier yesterday and just other these kinds of initiatives and really how we're partnering with Google. So a little bit about us and kinds of the things that we build. I'll be spending all of my time really today talking about Tracemark, and the idea is really in partnership with Google, and actually we are the implementation partner for some of the partnership work between Google and Unilever. Some of the work that we're trying to accomplish is around how do we actually build out those kinds of systems that you know, was just explained in so much detail for these types of organizations. But I'm gonna spend my time really talking about the complexities that organizations might face, and I'm gonna use coffee as my main example. So a little bit about coffee, 
Uh, this is a space where I work in, in quite frequently, so this is kind of close to my heart. But coffee is normally exported from a country of origin. It's normally processed. It's an unroasted bean. You know, for those of you who are coffee nerds, this is often called like a green bean or something else like that. So a coffee purchaser will purchase a number of different beans produced by farmers, and they're thinking about things like taste, quality, and varietal. So I, yeah, sorry, skip the slide there for a sec. So when you think about coffee, you know, there's things like single origin, which you may have heard about, and there's other things like coffee blends. And I've made up this entire diagram, so don't assume this means anything in particular. But the idea is it's really comprised of a number of different beans that are trying to create a consistency and a flavor profile, right? If you're buying a bag of beans from the store, you want it to taste roughly the same every time. However, that's a challenge, right? We have smallholder farmers. You know, there's hundreds of thousands of various coffee farmers who might be in an overall ecosystem. So each lot you know, even if it's the same skew, is going to have beans from different locations. And then roasting is normally done in a country of origin, so there's this massive aggregation problem, right? So if, if a, a company is buying a large number of beans, you know, and they're thinking about, okay, we've got a silo or we've got some other way of containing these beans that's thousands of pounds, that might be from thousands of locations, right? And when we think about that in the context of EU deforestation, this really represents a sizable challenge. So really that the kind of the two parts of the deforestation regulation, this has been covered already a little bit now, is there's kind of these two requirements that we're focused on is the geolocation of the plots of land, and then also ensuring that there's conclusive and verifiable information that the products are deforestation free. You've heard a lot about that, so no need to elaborate further. But in our opinion, this really highlights the crux of the problem, especially for an organization. They have to perform due diligence by combining their transactional data around what beans are roasted as part of a given lot where and when are those beans sourced within the supply chain, and then also those sustainability in fa you know, facts and insights around deforestation risk and other risks and social risks really around the ability to pr produce that beans there. So I think this really kind of highlights what we see as the problem is if your due diligence statement, for example, covers 10,000 pounds of beans, and it turns out that one of those sources is no good, so many of these organizations are saying, we may have to just throw out the entire 10,000 pounds. Because the way that the regulation is written is, unless you can properly keep that verified, we're talking about either massive you know, loss, recall in some scenarios, very costly scenarios that organizations are looking at to say, this is quite serious to how business will be run, right? That the risk of having to go through these very expensive operational challenges, you know, entirely unrelated to the science itself. Just how would an organization pull back 10,000 pounds of beans or throw out entire shipping containers worth of beans. Like this is the, the scope and the magnitude of the business challenge, right? So we see kind of our opportunity of saying, take this you know, amazing scientific community and the other folks who are here working on what is the definition of forest? How do we know what deforestation is and isn't? And kind of bring some of that complexity in a way that's a little bit simpler for these organizations to bring, to bring together, right? So helping them focus on how do we take our transactional data, our view of the problem, and then marry that with the science and the sustainability insights that we're bringing together. So some of, the, some of the areas that we're focused on today, as mentioned, we're working with Unilever, so we're doing a lot in the palm oil related space. You know, we're in fairly advanced conversations across a number of these different commodities. This is an evolving problem, right? There's a lot of things that we're bringing today and how we work and partner with organizations to create you know, UIs and dashboards and take advantage of that science. But we see ourselves over the next year really making sure that this effort is done in partnership, both on the science side, around making sure we're bringing in the right map layers and the data products that you've already heard about for the last 10 or so minutes, but then making sure that we work with enterprises around how will you actually take this data, make it useful, and hopefully avoid some of these really negative business outcomes that we've spent some time on already. So thank you so much for the time. Looking forward to more conversation. Hey everybody, my name is Evan Toski. I'm the Global Director of the Data Lab at WRI. Uh, I'm a data scientist by training, I'm not a policy person, so I'm gonna talk to you today a little bit about what we can do as a technical community to support all of this important work you've seen here. So many of you will actually work on projects and organizations and teams that work directly on EUDR, but many more of you will build technology or train people, train students, and work with others who will go on to carry on this legacy. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about what we can do as a community to actually make sure that we have uh, the geospatial infrastructure, tools, and support to actually implement and follow through on this. Um, so at WRI, of course, we have teams that produce uh, data layers, teams that produce platforms, and teams that work directly with a number of companies in similar ways to others described here. But when we think about the next generation of tools, there are three things that we're actually shifting towards. So the first is not just platforms, but open infrastructure. Um, this is key and was highlighted in Remy's. The digital public infrastructure to, to enable a whole bunch of other platforms to work is more important than just the success of one platform. Um, 
when you get into this, we have, a, of, I think, a strong view kind of coming from the startup space that someone has to win the market. When you think about all the problems we're, we're kind of highlighting here, there isn't just one market. There's a million sort of sub-markets and problems and areas. And so it's going to take a number of different solutions, solutions built here in, in, in Silicon Valley, but also solutions built in the global south. And our infrastructure, we believe, is what's needed to unlock that. So very specifically, what does that mean? That means work today on foundational models is incredibly important for geospatial, because those models will be what it's, what's needed for others who maybe don't have access to the scale of compute or the, the sort of training to actually build models that work for their communities. And so if you're working on a foundational model today or you're working towards those efforts, you're helping us and future us uh, work toward compliance with the UDR. Uh, the second thing is we believe we're, we're going more towards tailored apps and very specific use cases. Uh, I think in the Geo for Good community and the sort of general data for good community, we've come from a place of like big platforms. We have one at WRI. We have this thing called Resource Watch. They're actually in the process of winding down and decommissioning. 500 data sets, a million map layers, gadgets, whiz, gizmos everywhere. And the usage isn't there, right? I'll tell you honestly, the usage isn't there. Where's the usage? A very simple platform called GFW Pro which is a version of our GFW that's made for the needs, the specific needs of commodity firms. And it's extremely simple in the functionality. It allows an API interface for folks to give us data on points, get back various information from GFW, and then there are other functionalities. But it's very simply focused on this. And the uptake we see with that is massive. Similarly, on the other end of the spectrum, we have a mobile application called Forest Watcher. And Forest Watcher is meant to put this information in the hands of people who are frontline forest defenders, journalists who might be investigating things, totally other end of the spectrum from you know, big consumer good companies. And that works for them because it's in the size and shape and really tailored to their needs. Get some of the same information that folks are getting on GFW Pro, but in a totally different package, totally different usability, um, and totally different languages and a whole bunch of other things that actually make it really accessible. The third thing that we think is important that we're shifting more towards is community building and support. Um, this law doesn't work and isn't equitable without actually building communities of folks on the ground who are benefiting from this regulation, right? This is, in addition to being a massive important experiment for climate, this is one of the biggest economic ex experiments in the world. We're going into every supply chain, people's livelihoods, and changing things significantly. And if we don't empower communities to understand this law, to understand their own data, to understand the sort of things that we'll be asking them for as a global community of people who work for big companies, people who work for big organizations, they'll be left out. And as a geospatial community, we have a profound uh, tradition of making things better, but we also have made things worse. Um, way back in grad school, I did a lot of work on redlining in the US. And you see that applications of risk frameworks and things that are meant entirely, you know, perfectly in good, in good stead. Redlining here in the US was a sort of insurance framework, right? It's very straightforward, need to have insurance, and so we need frameworks for that. But that led to unintended consequences of generations of disenfranchisement. And if we don't empower communities, we don't train communities and support communities, we're at risk of, of being well-intentioned but ultimately ending up with outcomes that I don't think anyone in this room would want. And so those three things, you know, of course, we have the same sort of stuff we've always done at WRI. We publish reports, build tools, but increasingly shifting to public infrastructure, um, tailored apps, very specific things, and then building and supporting communities are where we're going. And uh, so excited to do that with all of you. So thanks. All right, big thank you for everyone who spoke. Um, so now we're going to, and we go until uh, 2.45, correct? Okay, good. Um, so let me find my notes here. So we're gonna have a panel. Uh, we're gonna have a panel discussion. Oh, where's my cursor? <laughs> Sorry, my cursor ran away. There it is. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, why don't you guys uh, come on up here, and you know we can we can have a quick discussion, and then we'll go to audience questions. So, um, and there's another microphone there. Uh, on the table, yeah, or you guys can stand up here, either way. <laughs> awesome, awesome, awesome. That's totally fine. Um, all right, so there's also another microphone over there um, on the table. Uh, maybe Remy, you can grab that. Great. 
I know, I know. Thank you for uh, being flexible here. <laughs> um, all right, so I have some uh, some questions, but I'm also happy to, you know, if you guys have other questions for each other or things like that that come up in the course of discussion, happy to go off script a bit as well. So the first question I have um, is, where do you think the biggest gap is now for companies that need to comply with this regulation? And I'd love for Pierre and maybe Bobby to start with that. Yes, it's working. Uh, biggest gap uh, within this regulation for us is A, the identification of the field geometries. That's, that's the most difficult part. There are many data sets available with geometries that are predefined, and usually they are actually always related to farms, farms that actually grow different commodities, and the EUDR regulation is commodity-based. So once you have, I was talking about cars previously, so cars is uh, referencing all the farms uh, in Brazil, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, uh, and this is farm related. So if you're growing different commodities, but you only actually sp want to get the specific delineation for soil, you need to like go to this car number, split it again manually or automatically, and uh, identify each crop that exists within, uh, within this field. And that's great because Brazil have cars, but there are many countries that have nothing. And there you're like all alone with your Earth observation automatic tools trying to find the fields uh, within the forest because coffee, is a shaded uh, commodity and it grows within other trees, so it looks exactly like forest. So that's that's uh, the main the main the main gap for us. Yeah, I would say it's the same exact thing that, that we we think about and we talk about. I think the challenge, especially from like a larger organization perspective, is normally there's a number of different tiers in their supply chain, and they may have certain relationships to a certain point. And then they expect that their suppliers have to go talk to their suppliers. And you get this very convoluted game of telephone. And as you were mentioning, it's not necessarily a remote sensing solvable problem in all cases. right? Like there isn't going to be some capability that allows us to know, like, just because I can see that it's a farm from space does not mean I know who they sell to. right? What happens when it goes with, into a shipping container or to some other facility? How does it actually reach? those points in the supply chain, right? So the linkage is, is, a, is a big problem. I think the other part is going to be around like kind of the, the balancing of kind of what is seen as a little bit of security and IP, especially around like sharing some of these sourcing locations. Like there's a, there's a bit of a, a dynamic shift that needs to happen in terms of like engagement with farmers and with those who are actually maintaining these areas is very difficult right now because you ask questions that they don't un either don't understand why they're answering or they don't see enough value in answering some of the questions. You know, many companies have their own processes and certifications and surveys. So you're saying like, how much effort do I have to go through in order to actually, you know, follow or you know check all the boxes in someone's various checklists? And you know, it's it's a big administrative burden, especially for these smaller organizations, right? So there's a bit of a dynamic shift that I think we're trying to contend against there. Uh, two things. I think one thing is, as I said before, I, I don't think this will be solved if we try to do parcel by parcel. It has to be uh, the property. Uh, anything else would be like just a guess, because you say, oh, oh, you can clear cut the forest here for this crop that is not... If the, if the objective of the law is to stop deforestation, <laughs> I mean, it's not a question, oh, this parcel here is for soya bean, there's no new deforestation, but I keep clear cutting this for other crops. Like, it makes no sense. So, this, I mean, you can even take this as a decision. Say, like, you know, for your control, you say, well, I'm, I'm simply considering the property because it's much safer than trying to find out the property. So, I think this could be. The other thing about the, the chain of custody, I think there is a lot of uh, lessons from the whole process of FSC certification because, yeah, you know, we spent 30 years almost like building up this thing and the end result of that that's the only way to do is this mass balance it's we'll not find a way to do like tracking every um truck and etc and and actually this will not help the objective it's like the, if our objective is really the deforestation in a simple ba mass balance control by region will help us to to get through at least on the beginning just make something that is simple mass balance and, and this is, these two things are very important because as much as we make this complicated, we have an argument to uh, postpone the beginning. Because we will arrive at the end of 2024, because, oh, it's impossible to do it, postpone. 
So the, it, we have to do something that's much more simple to start. And then, and then you can, okay, we can start. And then we, we go and kind of a, a lock in as we go and uh, do this. Would the EU Commission be open to, you know, taking an approach like Tasso was describing, um, that you know is a little bit more of a, a step towards the, you know, way that the regulation is uh, written today? Um. Um, so I, first thing, uh, I, maybe the really long term objective of the, of the of the European Commission is to eliminate deforestation, but at the moment, the only objective of the European Commission is to prevent products that are deforestationary to enter the EU market. Mm. And they don't really care what's going to happen otherwise. And to be honest, there's a lot of collateral damage that's going to happen on some commodities just because of the definition. And shaded crops, let's just be clear, coffee, cocoa, because the, the, main, the, main, the main aspect of the definition on deforestation is the change on land use. So you enter forest, if, if it's classified as a forest, you enter it, you enter any crop in it, it's, it's considered deforestation. And that cannot enter the market anymore. That's done. So um, my first advice would be uh, to actually look at economists and, uh, and legal people because there's a lot of those products that we have to go to other markets. Mm. Yeah. That's, that, I think that's going to be a reality in uh, 2024, December, December 2024. Um, but so to, uh, I think there is, there is definitely a stepwise approach that's going to happen. Um, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of um, specifications that are not existing yet, so, so it's still it's still uh, uh, ongoing pro process. What you mentioned around Cerrado is something that is already considered. They already consider uh, including other wooded lands in the upcoming iterations next year of the, of the regulation. So they do they have that uh, stepwise uh, approach in mind, um, and. Uh, what can I say? No, yeah, uh, I think uh, I think we, we we should be very conscious that the I think the EC wanted to target uh, the the big bulk of deforestation associated to agricultural development, mm -hmm. want to prevent that to enter the market, and took some decisions to make it relatively clear in terms of uh, semantics and definitions, and that because of that there will be collateral damage on on markets and there will be some change in the supply chains. Thank you very much. May I jump on this one? Yes, please. So just to jump on the, on the, on the definition problem, um, there is one issue that we, we, we as, a, uh, as a private company, we cannot actually uh, handle, which is the definition of what was forest in 2020. There are like hundreds of data sets that are defining what is forest, what is non-forest. Most of them are actually not defining what's forest and non-forest, but what is tree and not tree. So back again, palm trees, coffee, cocoa. But um, at the moment, the European Commission has not said this data set is the truth. And all the others, you can use them, but they are um, just helping you building your, your uh, forest mask, probability mask. So as long as we don't really know which is uh, the, the reference data set, and I'm not sure that they will actually select one, uh, every uh, private company will select its provider, will select its data set, and send to the EU due diligence report that will be based on different uh, sources. And that's uh, an inconsistency that we don't know how the European Commission will actually handle. <laughs> <laughs> can, can I just say that I'm pretty sure they won't. I'm pretty sure they will not to take any responsibility in saying this is the data set to use. We, you have to know that. And yes, you, you're right. You, until then, and, and as long as the regulation is going to be on, it's going to be your responsibility to provide the due diligence, and then it's going to be their problem to verify. Mm -hmm. And, and just to be honest, like <laughs> it doesn't great. really One matter. Question. Because it's like 80%, I mean, if we can tackle 80%, 90% of the problem, that's done. Right? You don't have to be guaranteed that this will be like 100%. So if you have a, you know, your map, your reference, and it's working, maybe there will be a, an error here and there. That's cool. Just have, we have to think about the scale of the problem. Like mm -hmm. if we just. That's good for you, we are fine. Yeah? Yeah. No, no. <laughs> no, no. What I'm saying is that if the regulation says that your, ma your map is fine, you know, whatever the map that represents is fine, I mean, for, what I'm saying is that for the objective, it's, yes. it's mm -hmm. fine. It's fine that, that you have different maps because like, the different maps will not be so different. They will be like different. There will be things here and there. And for the big thing, like think of the big picture. Like we are basically, we want to 
we, we have 4 million hectares of deforestation every year. Those commodities are representing 80% of them. If we solve 80%, I mean, we will take down 60% of the deforestation. It's an amazing achievement that we can have, like yeah. forced by one small market. Yeah. Because comparable, it's not, the market's not even that big, but uh, like companies like your size will have to apply the same kind of a practice, whatever your market you go, right? Because you, if, you, if you go to the higher tier, it will happen. So I think this is like a... Yeah. So... I guess this is a somewhat a nice segue into another question I had um, for the panel was, um, what role do you see commercial data or solutions providers um, in supporting companies to meet this regulation? And kind of as a follow-up question, like what degree of like scientific scrutiny and transparency do you think will be needed from those commercial providers? Um, and maybe Evan, do you want to start with that? Sure, go to the non-commercial person to. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we have a saying at Debray, when do you know when to stop? And we stop when the major consultancies come in, uh, as a general rule, right? And so if a, a major consulting firm feels there's enough market, enough standardization, enough kind of thing there, you probably don't actually need us. Now, in this case, I think that's, that's partially true, but partially not true in that I think there will be a lot of providers who step up to serve EU DR compliance. But to Tasso's point, the big picture is deforestation globally and the climate crisis. And so we will still need global data layers. We will still need people actually monitoring and reporting on how this whole EUDR ecosystem plays out in the big chip big picture. Is there just displacement? Or is there sort of massive economic failure in certain places that actually increases uh, famines or something like that? There's a bigger picture out there, and, and EUDR is part of a system that's changing. And so I think on our picture, we would say we still monitor the globe. We still build these global data layers that are meant to be open, transparent, and help scientists, help policymakers, help journalists understand how the world is changing. Um, specifically on the point around commercial data products, I think there's an, it's incredible to harness the innovation of the private sector working toward this problem. And I think we see more and more of that every day. I think we also see a lot of folks who do not stop to document their work. And that if they did stop to document the work, I think a lot of the buyers would be uh, less than excited about the results of that documentation. Um, and so I would encourage everyone who is, of course, a scrupulous actor and doing amazing stuff, document it, even if it's only internal and you can't and your legal team won't let you release it. But write that down. Like, <laughs> what are these definitions? What is this data? How have we tested it? What, what are the sort of metrics we're reporting? What actual, you know, have we kind of almost red teamed that process? And even if it's just for you and your soul to know that you're selling something good, it's important to have that documented. And then it would be amazing if more people release these, either through publication or simply through greater transparency. And I think in our experience as a nonprofit, offering products in this market, uh, we get people coming to us because of that, because of the transparency, and simply because of that. I don't think that'll always be the case. I hope that the bar will go up and we won't uh, maybe in the future even need to offer products for companies in, in this way. But people are coming to us because of the transparency, because we can show everyone all of the code, because we can actually walk people through that. And you know, Startups won't always be able to do that because you're competing for certain things. But the more we can emulate that as a community, I think the better off we'll be. Awesome. Does anyone else want to add? To yeah, that? sure. Okay. So <laughs> the I cannot agree more. Please let me know what you're doing. Like when you're a private provider and you're coming to a company and saying, we can manage your problem, but you're not explaining your methodology, we cannot really use your solution. Because the issue that we have of definition, the only solution that we can have is transparency transparency on your methodology. Because if we can send the due diligence report and say, this is the methodology that has been used to perform the due diligence report, then at least we are on the safe side, side when we are talking to the European Commission. If it's a black box, they have all the reason not to trust you, and we have all the reason not to work with you. Awesome. Um, I want to, uh, this is a great. What does the great... regulation say about the transparency? Uh, yeah, thank you, Brady. What is the regulation? Oh. Transparency. <laughs> like this, this is potentially a huge data set for academics, watchdog groups, everything. Will they have access to it or only if there is actors that want to make it transparent? Or is there something in the regulation about being open uh, Are with you the asking data? about um, the specific like due diligence reports or the data layers? No, even the data that was going into that, what is the... Remy, do you want I'm, I'm happy to answer to that. Um, so the regulation says that all the information that will be disclosed will be centralized through an information system, which is not yet completely defined, that is supposed to come in December 2023, so watch out. Um, <laughs> and as per the, I don't know, it's principle of the EU, all the data that will be inside this will be fully public. It will be fully anonymized and fully public, but that's going to be only the information that is disclosed by the operators. 
So the operators will disclose their fields and uh, the, the information from all those fields. And it will be there with the associated uh, uh, information on deforestation. So this is going to be public. And this is going to be fully out there. So the polygons are available, but it's anonymized? Yes. That's, that's, okay. what, that, <laughs> that's what the regulation says. Well, and also as part of the due diligence, the operators, I believe, do have to say like, what method they used, what data set, et cetera, in order to kind of prove um, you know, their due diligence through the risk assessment. So I don't know that they actually have to actually submit that particular data set, but they have to at least reference it and how they got to that. I understand correctly this thing about the polygons that you have like like a hundred polygons related to you, whatever is a company. What you not see is who is the yeah. you know holder the, of that polygon. The operator. You just know that you you have them as a reference of something that comes. So I think that's the anonymization that we are talking about, right? That's yes. It will. So the 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 reports will be will be. I don't know if all the reports will be made available, but right. yeah, probably. Um, but the, the database itself will just contain those geometries and the associated risk of deforestation. Gotcha. Um, it's good, good to know, though, as well, that like some of the due diligence statements will have to reference other due diligence statements. So you'll get this kind of cascading set of due diligence statement problem, <laughs> which you know it, I think a lot of the work that we'll end up doing will be actually rather operational and procedural, right? Like kind of in my place in the market, it's going to be like, I don't hope to make any model layers myself, personally, right? Like, I would rather that I'm, I'm pulling from one that's well peer reviewed, that's recognized, and most of there's, there's gonna be a lot of work on like, what was the process we followed? Because if it turns out that there's no deforestation, it's fairly simple. But like, if you're not sure, or if there's a high enough risk, like, oh boy, like the process that you're gonna have to go through, I think there's gonna be a lot of strange cost benefit analysis. And like, I think there's some points around exclusion and segregation that were mentioned as well, of like, what's it going to be worth to go and figure out you know, is there deforestation in this area? You may reach a point where you're saying, well, we're only sourcing, you know, a couple hundred pounds of product. Am I gonna go pay for a satellite tasking, right? Like, there's gonna be these weird numbers that organizations get to, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of, to the point earlier, there's a lot of economic ramifications, right? So, like, I think, like, part of where this ecosystem should go is, like, I hope to not see myself as being, like, in the compliance industry, right? I think there's a hope here that it's gonna be a little bit more of, like, how are we both, you know, reshaping supply chains in a positive sense, but also thinking a lot about, like, what are the underlying economics of these areas? What are the, like, by moving supply chains away, what does that actually mean, right? Like, I'd like to see kind of, like, private actors and, and kind of companies taking some of that intentionality into that approach. Like, I think a lot about, for example, like the stranded asset problem, where someone's like, oh, like, we don't, we don't, we sold away a, a particularly expensive or, like, carbon-intensive part of our business. It's like someone still bought it. It didn't really like, it didn't poof out of existence, right? And I think those are the kinds of activities that like, it's probably on this community in a certain sense to say like, how do we make sure that we just don't have some super companies that can just exclude parts of the market or change their supply chains in a way, but leave a lot of groups behind, so. All right, guys, we have uh, five minutes left. I know we have one, at least two more questions. Brady. Uh... Yeah, hi. Um, I was oh, wondering, sorry. I have two questions. Uh, one was, uh, when you're talking about deforestation risk, is it, at the point of planting, is it during the process? Is it at sowing? Are you calculating risk of deforestation even before any of these processes actually start? Um, and at what resolution are you measuring? Like, how do you say that a three meter, a point 50 centimeter resolution map of deforestation and some other company does a coarser resolution versus a finer resolution? How do you even like say like this better than this like, is there even an uncertainty marking in any way? And the next question I have is, is there any concept of something like blockchain monitoring of food traceability? Like, people have tried this approach, right? Where at every step there is a monitoring that goes in in terms of like auditors, in terms of like where the food actually comes from, apart from doing high level risk assessment from satellites, I was just curious. Okay. Um, on. The, the information that, that needs to come at the moment, the, the only real information is, was in 2020, the 31st of December 2020, was your field forest or not? That's the inf only information you actually need to provide. Because uh, cause you say, hey, this is my field, here is where I grow my crop. So if this is where my crop is and this was forest in 2020, I deforested. End of the story. 
uh, there is no real specification. Um, there is specification on the field uh, precisions, and uh, I think something around three meters. But uh, there no other specifications on what type of data, on what, what you need to do. It's just like you have to make a due diligence on uh, whether you deforested or not. And in, in the end, it boils down to, was it forest in 2020? If it was, it's untouchable forever. And if it was not for forest in 2020, there is still somehow in 2025, maybe 2026, we're going to have regrowth. You're going to still have to prove that it was not deforested, so it, it didn't grow into a forest. But that's the only thing that's interesting. So we, we don't even actually need information on deforestation. We need information on status of forest, which is why it's so important to have the difference between, um, between crops that look like forests and, uh, and, and forest. to say like 2020 it was not forest and we're good for the next 10 years we don't have to report on this every year Unclear. or every month or something thank yeah. you you will actually need to report if the if the if the plot has changed crop yeah. okay. so that's the first thing then when you were asking when should we check uh, if it's actually deforested or not don't forget that there's cattle in the list and they are actually born grown and killed in different places so plants are point of growth and harvesting, but for cattle, that's a bit different. And uh, when you were sp uh, speaking about um, definition, so Remy, there's definition on, on the geometry. So it needs to use six digit for, uh, for the GPS coordinates, but there's no other uh, specification. So if you want to do a triangle with three points with six digit, apparently it works. I think there but, was uh, but, this one is, more question, um, and we only have like two minutes. So I wanted to get to that real quick. I just wanted to ask about um, you spoke about anonymizing polygons, and I'm thinking, well, you can't really anonymize it if it's got a Latin along, you know, where it is. And um, the farmers might not want to tell you where their plots are. And how do you deal with those sorts of issues? Yeah, if they can't, if they can't tell, they will not be able to sell. But, it's, it's yeah. easy. but I think the question is like, it's, it simply makes absolutely no sense that this is done by plot. That's not how deforestation happens. Like if we go, deforestation is growing every year. So if you take a, you know, a typical farm in uh, Mato Grosso, for example, for a soybean, you have like, you know, 200 hectares of one plot, 100 hectares were, were deforested before, you know, 2020, another one was after, and then this is the plot. What, what you expect? He goes and says, oh, I, now I have two plots. This plot here is, I can sell to Europe, this other plot I can't sell to Europe. It's completely ridiculous, makes absolutely no sense to make that. So it's kind of, I, I think that those things, no, it's like, it's, it's very simple, it's very practical topic. Like there is no way that you will be able to separate it. No way, there's no way. Like nobody will harvest things and separate into trucks and things like this. So the, the way, the, in practical terms, what, what will happen is you have to work in properties. Otherwise, you always run on the risk that the, you have this contamination and so on. But I think this is why they make it complicated. I think their initial goal was to actually <laughs> prevent deforestation to happen, and it's so complicated. As Bobby was saying, if you don't deforest, if you don't have deforestation here and then here, then you're fine. And this is like basically supply chains that don't have deforestation will be good to go. Deforestation that are, uh, the supply chains that are associated with deforestation will not enter the market because it's so complex and it's so risky that they will not do it. The, if there is any risk, there was one thing I wanted to finish on, if there's any risk of suspicion on any part of the shipments, it says that the country receiving have the right to stop the containers for three days. Like you, if, we, if we think about how, how, how much it's going to cost to have... Sh ships waiting for verification to come, and if there's no verification, then they have they have the right to prolong. It's it's det deterring mechanism. Yeah. yeah, no, it definitely is, and we are out of time. But I can tell that this is a very hot topic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very glad that we had this amazing discussion. <laughs> so I'd encourage you all, um, if you're interested in kind of getting into the like next level tech like tech session about um, commodity mapping and understanding the current state of that, that is happening in at three o'clock in the same room. Um, and please give a big round of applause to our panelists. Here.